Throughout the history of crypto, there have been many times when it would have been fair to say that the future of our space was uncertain, cloudy, or hazy. We've had crazy downturns, wholesale bans by very large nation states, and we've almost always been on the verge of some kind of regulatory crackdown. But crypto has famously outlived every single prognostication of its death. However, we have yet to achieve decorrelation from the traditional economic system and its financial markets. That means it's still relevant to us that the gigantic Chinese real estate sector seems to be imploding before our eyes, while the U.S., by the GDP numbers, has just today fallen into what many would call a technical recession, while simultaneously experiencing inflation that's almost unprecedented in modern times. A lot of people are asking the question, is the global economy already staring into the abyss? And could it drag crypto and Cardano down there along with it? Ready? Let's go. Today, we are going to discuss the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis numbers that came out this morning, the state of the Chinese real estate market that we've been following for some time now, the July Cardano 360, what it told us and what it didn't tell us, and a Cardano metaverse onboarding what seems like a very experienced team member. If you've ever been in the ocean in a strange place and felt that creepy feeling like a plastic bag in the water touching your bare leg, only to realize that it's definitely a jellyfish and you have no idea if the local jellyfish are venomous or not, or if you're finding value in these videos each weekday, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies Stake Pool, ticker AOS. Don't forget... Saturday, this Saturday, we will be having the live stream to celebrate 400 episodes. That'll be happening at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. If you're not anywhere near either of those two time zones, that is six hours prior to when the videos normally happen during the week. So six hours prior to the normal time, we'll be having a live stream. Come on by if you're not busy. Here it is, guys, what we were waiting for. This is the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, and as suspected, they're showing negative GDP growth at an annualized rate of negative 0.9%, so just under 1% for Q2. What does this mean? If you ask the current administration in the White House, they're going to tell you that this means the economy is fantastic. Uncle Joe is taking care of you, nothing to worry about. We're certainly not in a recession. If you ask the rest of the world, they will tell you that two quarters of negative GDP growth means we are in a technical recession, whether the National Bureau of Economic Research, the official arbiter of recessions calls it one or not. We are now in a technical recession. And this is happening simultaneously with these inflation rates that are pretty much unprecedented in modern times. Even Forbes was willing to say that this signals the start of a technical recession, even as economists predict signs of a slowdown will only grow in the coming quarters. And they were quick to rub it in that just on Wednesday, Fed Chair Jay Powell said it doesn't make sense that the economy would be in recession. Forbes says other experts say it's likely only a matter of time until the government officially recognizes it. They go on, the government blamed the worse than expected figure on declines in residential investments or home buying. This is kind of circular because the federal funds rate, any hike there definitely ends up having an impact on the mortgage market. But if you insist on talking about real estate, Forbes, let's talk for a second about real estate. We might as well go see what the National Association of Realtors is saying, since they definitely have a vested interest in not scaring off buyers. But even they are saying existing home sales are down 5.4% already. Existing home sales fell in June 2022 with declines in three out of four major U.S. regions month over month and down in all regions year over year. 
Pending home sales are down 8.6%. As rising mortgage rates and housing prices impacted potential buyers, pending sales fell in all four major regions in June 2022, with the West experiencing the largest monthly decline. They said nationally we're down 8.6%, but we were down the most in the West. So let's take a look at the West. It looks like according to this National Association of Realtors Index, the West is down 15.9%. And if I'm understanding this correctly, that's just month on month. Think about that. 16% down month on month. If almost 16% down month on month sounds bad to you, you'll find it amazing that the real estate sector is actually worse off in some other places. Longtime listeners will remember that I've been talking about the Chinese real estate sector for the past year, following everything that was happening with Evergrande and discussing what it might look like if the real estate market in the second biggest economy on earth were to unravel. You'll remember our discussions about how Chinese households have a comparatively very outsized allocation toward real estate investment, where some Western households might allocate certain funds toward things like equity investments, the stock market. Chinese households are allocating that money toward real estate investment. Also, we've got this phenomenon where local governments, municipalities, provincial governments, things like that, they're appropriating land that was once rural, selling it off to real estate developers, and then using those funds to fund infrastructure projects. Famously, the Chinese economy, huge amount of infrastructure development going on right now. It's been going on for a long time. And this funding mechanism has been a part of that. So what happens if this entire space starts to unravel? We saw the first signs of that with Evergrande and the gigantic the gigantic catastrophe that was happening there. Now we're getting headlines like this this week. China's property sales are set to plunge 30% worse than in 2008, S&P says. China's property sales will likely drop by about 30% this year, nearly two times worse than their prior forecast, S&P Global Rating said, citing a growing number of Chinese homebuyers suspending their mortgage payments. You probably saw headlines about this. We've seen uh, things that look like protests over, over mortgages, and you've seen headlines probably about uh, Chinese Chinese homeowners, homebuyers not making their mortgage payments in protest. CNBC says such a drop would be worse than in 2008 when sales fell by roughly 20%. So we're talking about worse than in the last real estate crisis. Here, Bloomberg is telling us that China's property crisis is burning the middle class stuck with huge loans. Homeowners are cutting spending, postponing marriage, and boycotting mortgage. If you think about economics from a demographic perspective, this is absolutely the last thing you want to see if you are hoping that your economy is going to continue growing at the rate it's currently growing at. Housing market no longer seen as a sure bet as economy slows. Lack of confidence in a market. Also, the last thing you want to see if you want that market to continue growing. They say China's deepening property bust is sending shockwaves to the nation's 400 million strong middle class, upending the belief that real estate is a surefire way to build wealth. So exactly how much money do they have in the real estate market? They say a growing number of the nation's middle class, which has an estimated 70% of its collective wealth tied up in housing. So think about that. The middle class of China has 70% of its collective wealth tied up in housing. And based on that other article, they're looking at a predicted 30% drop in real estate, which is also compounded by the fact that many of these same individuals in more than 90 cities, according to Bloomberg across China, 90 cities across China are boycotting a huge amount in combined mortgages after a bunch of the developers have halted projects. This is not the stuff of a booming economy. Those are just a few of the things going on in the two biggest economies in the world. I'll leave it to you to decide what impact that's going to have on the greater global economy and its financial markets that crypto unfortunately has not decorrelated itself from.
as crypto people, I think it's important for us to keep these really big macro trends on our radar. But back in the land of Cardano proper, we got the July Cardano 360 today. This was just a double H, just Harrison and Hammond, not a triple H, no Hemsley. Let's cut to the chase here. A lot of people were hoping that we would find out when the Vassal Hard Fork Combinator event was going to happen. We still don't know. They didn't tell us when Vassal is going to happen. They're working with a lot of the developers in the community. It sounds like they're getting a lot of input back from projects, but we don't know when Vassal is going to take place. This is a really big upgrade. It's Plutus 2.0. These SIPs plus pipelining are important. I think it'd be okay if Vassal happened in mid-August. I think it'd also be okay if Vassal happened in late August. I even think it would be okay if Vassal happened in mid-September. I know some people would be like frustrated that I even dared mention that, but I even think it'd be okay if Vassal happened in September. This is an important upgrade, and it's important they get it right. This is Cardano. Part of the reason I'm here is because they have this correctness thing. They want to do things correctly, not necessarily as quickly as possible. And Vossel, Vossel is another example of that. So I'll be happy if this happens next month or even the next the month after. As long as it's correct, I'll take that over quick. We also heard from Paulina Vinogradova on Babel fees. And this is, it looks like this was just a section from her larger presentation on Babel fees. And this section, it seems, was just devoted to sort of why paying the uh, transaction fees in ADA is, is the best structure and Babel fees is a better alternative than allowing, um, you know, sort of transaction, uh, transaction participants, transaction proposers to, uh, to pay to the chain directly in directly in native tokens, why Babel fees is the right solution. So this was sort of not to me, this seemed like not the part of her presentation that was going to be the explanation of exactly how Babel fees were going to work, but more why Babel fees are structured the way they are and how that fits into, um, sort of a, a more more efficient way to execute this without having to change sort of the fundamental architecture of the of the chain and the way fees are paid. So I think if you want some of those details on the mechanics of how Babel fees actually works, you're going to have to go to her full presentation because I don't think that was the part that was highlighted here in Cardano 360. I haven't watched the full presentation yet, but I'm looking forward to it. You might find it amusing that U.S. House Democrats are proposing new rules to ban stock trading in Congress. <laughs> this is pretty funny. Business Insider here, of course, is using the picture, you know, a pretty unflattering picture of Nancy Pelosi because there have been a lot of questions about her husband's stock trading, especially with NVIDIA recently. But this goes back quite a while. People are always amazed slash amused slash delighted or whatever would be the opposite of delighted dismayed at how much money she and her husband have made trading the market over all the year over all these years of course she claims her husband has not a single time traded on any information he got from her i'm guessing this means that they just never speak to each other because i, I would imagine over all the years of her service in the US Congress, she's probably told her husband about her work a little bit. And that, you know, that of course might aid someone trading in the markets. But it looks like what they're proposing is exactly what you'd expect. And that's that you would either they would either have to divest themselves of their uh, of their sort of equity holdings or they would have to go into a blind trust. I, th I think a blind trust is the thing that of course would make sense. Uh, we've had US presidents do this in the past. Blind trust, I mean, if you're if you're making policy at this level, I think it would be impossible for you to be trading your own portfolio and you know, somehow compartmentalizing that information you have in your head, which can certainly move markets. 
Finally, we've got a Cardano metaverse making a big move on the HR front. Carta Station says we have an exciting update to the team. We're happy to announce that Colin has officially joined the team as lead game developer. Colin started developing games 15 years ago. He spent the last six years working at Ubisoft on titles like Ghost Recon Wildlands and Breakpoint and Riders Republic. He has nine years of experience working on multiplayer games. Isn't this what we always kind of fantasized about, that Cardano metaverses would be developed by game developers who worked on things like Ghost Recon or Riders Republic? This is pretty big. I hope this is a trend that we see with some of the other metaverses. Of course, it's easy to connect, you know, uh, a certain level of skill or expertise with really well-known IP properties like Ghost Recon and Riders Republic. And I'm sure some of the other metaverses have very, very talented game developers as well. But this is the first time I've seen someone announce uh, a talent acquisition. Uh, of someone who is involved in projects that are so well known, like these Ghost Recon, Riders Republic, these are these are digital things, not metaverses per se, but digital things that I definitely recognize. Don't forget the live stream is going to go down Saturday night, 5 p.m. Pacific. 8 p.m. Eastern. That's six hours before our normal time. Join me if you're not busy. Otherwise, I hope you have a great weekend and I'll talk to you soon.